We are oh, live yeah. on Saturday night and only three minutes late. Only nice. We it's get dessert good. tonight. We exactly. get dessert. We get treats. Um, Evening cake. <laughs> how's it shaking, bacon? It's good. It's good. Yeah. yeah I had a. I didn't get too much sleep last night because I was having a bit of a, a little bit of a meltdown over my uh, computer last night. <laughs> um, partly because I was like, "How am I going to do the show?" Blah blah blah. But no, I spent like an hour on my PC last night, just like messing around with the settings, watching different YouTube videos, looking because up. Because you like, thought it was broken, right? Yeah, I thought it was broken um, because one of my monitors said out of range. Usually a pretty simple fix. Different YouTube videos. And, um, oh, okay. Sorry, hold on. Getting some feedback. Usually a pretty simple fix. Different YouTube videos. Oh, okay. Sorry, hold on. Getting some feedback. Usually a pretty simple fix. Oh, what have I done? There we go. Sorry. Yeah, it ended up just being a loose, uh, loose cord, and I was gutted. I like tried everything. <laughs> I reset everything, and I'm like, I don't even know. I don't remember my settings before. I'm like, I'm trying to like bring it, like set it back to what it was before. And like, oh yeah, the resolution's like not as good. And like HDR wasn't off. It was, yeah, big old, big old hoopla over just me not putting, checking my cords first. It's oh stupid. goodness. Funny though. I had a good laugh at like 3 a.m. when I finally got it figured out. <laughs> Boy, they, well, you don't look worse for wear. That is a handsome hat you have on. Thank you. I got it at Old Navy. I think it was like four bucks. It got even better by the second. I had, uh, I should have taken pictures. I had uh, uh, Noah stop by. Um, our nice. Store. And uh, How's he doing? I haven't heard from him in a while. He is good. He's got a new track dropping on March 3rd, which is oh, very that's exciting. Sick. That's soon. And uh, and so he stopped by with his partner Ariana and his sister Maddie and Maddie who says say hi to Brennan. Oh, nice! I yeah. miss him so much. And we I was listening walk. to Noah yesterday. We had a lovely walk. We went for a lovely walk, and it was brisk, but none of them brought hats, so I forced them to wear hats. <laughs> and so Maddie, someone got me a Justin Bieber toque one year and said, "Love yourself," and uh, <laughs> like the Justin Bieber logo. So Maddie, I, I made them close their eyes and I put that hat on Maddie. Um, That's funny. I got gifted a uh, Pathways to Education toque, which is a lot of Pathways logos on a toque. If you could imagine, just a lot of like logo -y. And so uh, 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 Noah got that one. <laughs> and uh, Ariana got one from Manitoulin Island. And again, probably the same company that made the the uh, Pathways one. It was a lot of Manitoulin everywhere. So she had that one. But I should That's have funny. Because it was sort of funny. Corey's here. Say hello, Corey. Hello, Corey. And Sheldon is here. Scuffed. I don't know if that's yeah. a reference. Scuffed might be in reference to your computer problems. I don't know. Yeah, it's like messed it up. Oh, okay. Yeah. As you know, I need to have things translated for me. Yeah. <laughs> Good old Urban Dictionary. Yeah. Um, to uh, tonight, we are having. Uh, 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 Very uh guest. it is an exciting guest and it's exciting because historically we don't book guests like in advance and we're trying to get there and uh lo and behold um simon reached out to the canadian center to end human trafficking and ashley is going to join us and talk and chat with us tonight and uh so that's exciting but it did make me as i was preparing it and i'll share more when she joins us but i realized that we normally spend a lot of time laughing on this show and we're going to have to find some avenue for laughter because it is such a heavy topic and a serious topic, but I can't spend a Saturday night and <laughs> have some giggles at some point. So I just want to put that out there. So I'm hoping she knows. I'm hoping she's punny. And you know, so. Or at least just enjoys puns. <laughs> enjoys puns because I'll, I'll, I'll like Google them and uh, find a bunch. Um, today. Wait, you're Googling puns around ending human sex trafficking is that well, what i don't think there's any of those i don't think there's ending human I, trafficking. I think so. but but we'll have to find a space or a place for puns now tell me a story about a random act of kindness you experienced this week this week yes um on your car my car oh on my car yeah just the other day um 
no, it was just super random. Um, uh, I just went up to my car and there was a, I still have it actually one sec. There was a little tiny, uh, I collect these little Star Wars figures. Of like Collectibles. Like, I thought they were called collectibles. What's that? Aren't they called collectibles? Yeah. Because um, remember, you, but, you punished me for calling them dolls. Yeah. Uh, someone left this on my windshield. A little tiny Star Wars figure. And, and do you remember what? Isn't that fantastic? Just a random. Look how small it is. And what day did that happen? Was that was it yesterday or day before? Well, Thursday? I don't know. I think if I'm not mistaken, was it not? Um, uh, uh, so yesterday, and yesterday was the uh, random act of kindness day. Oh, was it really? It was. That's funny. I didn't yeah, even so, know that. So that's delightful. And you have no idea who left it there. Um, I think it was one of my buddies, one of my my good big bros, uh, Vin Vinny, Vincent yeah. Little Boy. Yeah, shout out, fellow my big fellow Pens fan, Penguins fan. But uh, I think so. It, it might have been him, but I don't know. I don't know for sure. I, I thought either had, way, I'm super grateful. I thought it had your mom written all over it, but could be, could be. Yeah. yeah. So if Mellow Tunes, he didn't message me about it though. Well, I think that's the whole thing about Random Act of Kindness Day is that you're not supposed to. You are, uh, it's fair. You're, uh, yeah, you're not supposed to, uh, tell people. I don't think it's, uh, it's funny. I'm reading a book on kindness right now, and, uh, and I would like to think I'm a kind person. Like, I'd like to think inherently. And, uh, and it is amazing as I read this book and as it talks, and it's just a series of short little, and they're not even essays, really. They're like two pages or so. And, but, it is so good for our spirits to be kind. It is so much easier to live in the world when you're kind to other people. And, and as I read this book and I think about my life, it's, it is, it's actually hard to be a jerk face. Yeah. It takes so much energy. Yeah. Like it really does. Like, and it sucks that energy out of you so that you're like depleted and you can't even be kind to yourself at that point right like like people who walk around and are just sort of jerk faces or not thinking of others or not thoughtful or and 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 maybe and there's a thousand and one reasons why they might be in that space but it just depletes their spirit like and so as i keep thinking about it the reality is that Kindness is really just about re-energizing your spirit. And the beauty of kindness is when you can be kind and you don't have to tell anyone you were kind, right? Like, I hope you never learn who left you that delightful, perfect Brennan gift. Like, yeah. I hope you never find out because the beauty of great kindness, and not everything has to be random and anonymous, but those moments allow people to, you just to experience kindness. Like, someone thought of you, and not just when they put it on your car, they saw it somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, that's Brennan. And they took it. And they then they took money out of their wallet or their plastic cards and that they had to work for. So somewhere they did something and sweated or and whether that was physically or mentally. They, and, and then they took that sweat and they were thinking of Brennan and they got this little token, right? And then they went to your house knowing that you wouldn't be up at X time a day. <laughs> and they put it there for you, right? Like all those steps, like, like we forget sometimes that, especially those random acts of kindness, those anonymous things, quite often they're anchored in all these steps of thinking about you in a good way, right? And uh, isn't that delightful when you think of all those steps? Like, and they took all those steps and they may never, you may never know who it was, but when they went to bed last night, all those steps brought them peace, brought them like, I don't know. Yeah. That's cool. Like, I just think it's interesting. It's uh, it's how we can refill our spirits. And on days where you're feeling off, I just suggest to folks all the time, try to be kind first, obviously to yourself, but be kind to other people.
like and share that kindness because it is kindness is we shared this uh post this week and uh i don't know if you saw it i i i, I said yeah, the one you tagged me in did i tag you in it yeah the superhero <laughs> one yes yeah it's funny <laughs> and and partly because it is like this uh it's uh it is i think it's just so critical that we work on how we can be kind to each other right so for folks who didn't see it so it is it is a superpower right it really is like and that's why i thought i think that's brennan in that little outfit there awfully I pale so. <laughs> well a little bit yeah <laughs> I, I i didn't want to mess with the the uh shading long mission in the arctic <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, so nonetheless, last topic really quickly before we have Ashley join us. While researching this post, because I wanted to make it as authentic as I could, uh, stop sharing, let's see. I, uh, I look, started looking up, uh, and did, oh, I think I, oh, that's what I did. So Ashley's going to join us right now. Nice. I'm like, why was this, the screen still sharing? Here we go. Hello. Hey there. Good evening. Oh. Hi, hey. Ashley. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you both? Well, great. Stick, but clearly I've never used Zoom before because I thought I was stopping the screen sharing and instead I welcomed you into the room. So you're here a few minutes early, but welcome. <laughs> I can step out if you need a few more minutes. Oh, no, no, no. We were just talking about kindness. It was uh, a random acts of kindness yesterday day. And uh, that's right. Um, so first of all, we've, we've not met, have we? We haven't officially, so nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you as well. And uh, and this is my very good friend, Brennan Gugu. Yeah, Hi, nice Brennan. to meet you, Ashley. Me yeah. as well. Although I believe I've heard a lot about you. Would that be a fair assumption? I don't know. Good things, I hope. Yes. Is it possible <laughs> that I know your mother? It is possible, yes. It is possible that yes, I know your yes. mother, she yeah. She speaks very highly of you. And likewise... I, uh, well, do you want to start with a story? Not necessarily about, well, a little bit about your mother. Do you want to start with a fun story? Please, yes. So, 10 years ago in January, uh, Three Things Consulting opened up and I had left my sort of, I'd had a series of contracts and I've been a consultant for a long time. I'm not really employee material, never have been. And, uh, so, but I had a couple of really great gigs that I had worked at for a long time for a number of years, but I knew that I wanted to do things differently and there was time for me to try to focus on healing as it relates to our peoples, right? As First Nations peoples. Mm -hmm. And uh, and a couple of things had lined up that allowed me to, to rebrand what I'd been doing and Three Things Consulting was born uh, late in 2012, the kind of concept came around and 2013, January, 10 years ago, we started officially. So the day that we sent out an email to about 1,800 contacts and our website went live and our Facebook page went live, um, that day I went to an event at your mother's house. And uh, when I got there, I walked in and... Uh, there was a table and again, I've literally just left a stable, secure world where I, mm -hmm. I never was like paychecks came like everyone else. Right. And I had said, no, thank you. I don't want that anymore. And I'm going to do this on my, they can do this in the, like a different way. Sounds sure. horrifying. So I'm a little anxious. I take the train to Toronto. I get to Toronto. And I go and I get to your to uh, this event that your mother's hosting, and I walk in, and there is this name tag. You might not be. Oh, you got I, this. I can... There we go. Oh, almost. And Peter Hodgson, three things consulting. The day that I we launch everything. That's and pretty a, amazing. <laughs> and it's a super fancy one too. It's like the one here. Like, it's like ooh, look how fancy that is. And so, but to see my name and three thing in that format, I an official. <laughs> oh, it was like mind blowing. Like it was absolutely mind blowing. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. And uh, ten years later, it is uh, 
yeah, it is this. And so I, I've held on to that. I don't think I've ever worn it since. <laughs> but uh, it's you know just... what, though? That is like a, a small act of kindness. And maybe it wouldn't have meant much to someone else. But that on your first day of launching your business was truly meaningful. Oh, it was beyond. Yeah, like it was. And it was just and part of the challenge is that in those spaces and places like lots of us, you don't always feel like you belong or you don't know if like and you get little imposter syndrome, like mm-hmm. should I be here? And yes. And lo and behold, I'm like, hey, I don't even need to get business cards now. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. nonetheless, in the uh, 10 years since, there's been lots of magic. And uh, so Brennan has uh, worked for three things in a number of ways. He started as a participant in one of our programs. Do you want to tell her a little bit, Brennan, about how you got connected? Yeah. Uh, was it was it 2017? Yeah. Yeah, so 2017, um, Three Things Consulting um, helped build the, and execute this project called uh, Msit Nogma, which is uh, taking um, 46 Indigenous youth um, uh, from across Canada um, to sail uh, across the North Atlantic Ocean. Okay, and we participated wow. in the um, Rendezvous um, Tall Ships Regatta. And um, from, so we sailed from Halifax to um, Le Havre, France, wow. in um in about a month, it was like three and a half weeks, and um and so yeah, um that's where um I was one of the participants. I was lucky enough to be a participant on that project, and um that's how I met Peter. And um fast forward, here we are, uh, still working together. Wonderful. Yeah. And are you still sailing? No, no. Um, <laughs> maybe. Um, I've I've done a couple things actually. Yeah. Um, just um. Just fixing like you know just taking them out in the in the bay and stuff little sailboats and stuff but um never back like on a tall ship or anything like that um maybe okay. maybe soon though we'll see we'll never know right <laughs> once the weather yeah. cooperates yeah i'm still in touch with a few of the sailors so never know it is a uh we've talked about trying to do it uh, uh, either bring them back again some of them or do it again in general but sometimes those projects happen and it's just the magic of the moment right True. we worked with a tremendous team of partners Ulanweg, the Mi'kmaq Friendship Center um AFN um I think there were others who were not oh Ulanweg, uh uh no uh Assembly First Nation Golden, the, uh, Golden, the Golden Leo yeah oh, the Golden, Golden Lion <laughs> so that Dutch name for the show. and that project was really about Water building Brown. identity right like helping young people and uh, mm-hmm. um, build their identity and who they are. Because when we talk about things like human trafficking and how to prevent it, and certainly for First Nation young people and, and Métis and Inuit young people, mm-hmm. it is essential that they know who they are, right? And uh, and have opportunities for that healing and around that intergenerational peace and and have pride in themselves. And I tell you, those there were 45 young people and three of our staff, and they sailed across the ocean. And watching them sail in in France and mind blowing, right? And and they were all, many of them were up on the and it was I think I think Simonic checked the other day. We had a meeting with the new police chief here in town and and Simonic they were chatting about it and I think he said it's 180 feet or something the the mast. Yeah. Like that. So they are all the way up there. Which and you're like, just standing on like things like this, like wires like that thick. Wow. And uh, yeah. and so like all wobbly. So it's funny. So lots of the work that we do is really anchored in prevention when we, <laughs> Good pun. there you go. We were saying <laughs> earlier before, before you joined us, we were saying we laugh a lot on the show and I was like, so it's, so it's good. So how, so we're going to have to find ways like puns or something. I don't know, like so to laugh about something that's not about something that's serious, but we'll have to mm. find to still laugh. So I said, maybe Ashley knows a bunch of puns and she'll tell us some. Oh, well, not related to trafficking, because unfortunately, that's, <laughs> it's a pretty yeah. heavy subject. Exactly. There's that's not what a I lot said. of, I don't think you yeah, there's not anything. a lot of yeah. light in the subject, unfortunately, but it's yeah. an important one. So yeah, so we weren't thinking you would provide human trafficking. <laughs> we were hoping okay. in general. <laughs> okay, okay. I will keep that in mind. <laughs> there you go. So um, anyway, so uh, long and short of it, to wrap up the last bit, it was, it was uh uh, the random act of kindness day the other day and we were just talking about how kindness is so healing that when we're able to be kind right and how it's actually those moments when you don't need to have people 
know that you were kind. <laughs> like that's the richest kind of kindness, right? Like when people provide those acts that just are and how it just can fill our spirit, right? It can just fill our tank with a reminder that we matter in this world, right? And helping someone else know that they matter in this world. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm a big fan of Random Act of Kindness Day. And so is Brennan as someone left him a Star Wars figure on his car. Oh yeah, God. I was super pumped. Yeah, super random, having a bad day, and then someone just left a little figure on my car. It, it was, yeah, I like it was funny because I like I left earlier that morning and I came back, and then um, it like snowed pretty heavily for like a, just like really quickly. So like when I went out there, the box was kind of mangled. Um, but yeah, it turned out great. And so that's generally our intro, and then we welcome our guest. So again, welcome Ashley. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> and uh, and so, as you may know, I've been working in this area for decades, um, for almost 30 years now. And, uh, and going back to the 90s when we hosted um, a, uh, the uh, International Summit um, of Trafficked Young People from, from the Americas um, in the 90s in Victoria. And uh, I had the privilege to spend a lot of time with my dear friend, Sherry Kingsley, who was a pioneer in this world. Um, she was experiential and she literally changed the world. And I don't know if you know about Sherry or her work, but um, Sherry, uh, um, and sadly, she passed last year due to COVID in Victoria. And uh, But she had been a champion and a uh, trailblazer um in the movement and in fact her work changed the language because at that time young people who were trafficked as we identify them now at the time were child prostitutes that was the language that was used and mm -hmm. and her work um and her her legacy is the shifting of policies she spoke at the united nations she spoke to parliament she spoke to the senate she spoke she crafted reports she traveled we traveled across the country and met with other experiential folks to lift their voices up and demand change and the one change that occurred was that shift to sexually exploited youth yeah. and fast forward then about 10 years or six years so or the 10 years probably and then that language which is still used in some in some spaces and uh and it sort of expanded to look at human trafficking um, or tra well, really it moved, I think, to trafficking mm -hmm. and uh, and then moved to sort of human trafficking and looking encompassing now uh, labor, sex trafficking, labor trafficking in the sort of the full spectrum. And so it has been a long journey that I've been on watching these shifts take place. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I'm really thrilled that you're here because I'm I'm and have been obviously since day one um so happy to see the center in its birth and uh as it continues to flourish and remain incredibly strong and what i think is super exciting is that if, and i could be mistaken but the center and you can tell us a bit more about it sure. um is um certainly being seen and recognized as a leader in the country and uh and so tell us a little bit about how the center came to be and how where it is at today if you don't mind sure yeah thanks peter um so really the center was 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 born out of the the results of the national task force on sex trafficking of women and girls which was funded by the canadian women's foundation um, and there were some incredibly um, insightful reports that were released at, at the end of that task force um, with a lot of really well thought out survivor led recommendations for the country of Canada. Um, but we know with many, many national reports, uh, they often sit on a shelf and they collect dust and really the two co-chairs of the task force really felt that deep in their bones, this was incredibly important work and they wanted the momentum to continue. Um, and part of the work that they saw through the task force was really the disjointed efforts and the lack of communication and collaboration and um, you know, folks working in silos and not talking to each other and not sharing best practices and 
um, that's really um, slowed progress, right? Uh, so they thought that they needed to create an entity to continue to move the needle forward, so to speak. And so um, the center was sort of, a, I think established in 2016. Um, so it was very small. When we talk about kitchen table advocacy, like it, we were literally at the kitchen table. Um, so it was a two, team of two. Um, and then we've steadily grown from there. Um, our sort of our largest project that the center has currently, we operate the Canadian Human Trafficking Hotline. Um, and that's funded through the Federal Department of Public Safety Canada. Um, but what's, what's a little bit unique about the center is we are national. So we, we have that kind of bird's eye view of what's happening across the country. Um, and we're not a traditional frontline delivery service organization. So we are connecting directly with victims and survivors of uh, trafficking through the hotline and, and the community um, at large as well. But um, we're not delivering in-person services. We're really in a unique space where we kind of play that catalyst role, right? That, that amplifier role. And so really we're working with our community partners, understanding what the gaps and the needs are of the sector and really helping to amplify that back to policymakers. Awesome, that's fantastic. And how long have you been with the center now? I have been with the center, oh my goodness, um, since 20, 16, 2016. Oh, like, so since, since nearly the beginning. Yes, yes. So I was employee number two. Uh, so I've been around for quite for some time. Um, and it's been really incredible to, to, again, to go from a really small entity with a really big vision. We have a really big vision, right? We want to end trafficking in Canada. Um, sadly, I don't think that's going to happen in my lifetime. Um, but I think that um, bringing people together and really starting the conversation and sharing those best practices and really duplicating efforts, right? You know, people are doing training over here or they're, they're getting funding to start training and there's so much training out there that already exists, right? And really just making sure that we're having a shared kind of language of understanding and really, um, you know, um, supporting trauma-informed work and survivor-led work. Like that's that's where we see our role in the space. Um, so it's been really incredible again to go from something really small, and we're we're about a team of thirty-two now. So we have, um, yeah. So half oh, of our man. staff. Good for you. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So the hotline is is operating 24/7, 365. Um, we're able to provide services in over two hundred different languages. We have um a simultaneous translation partner. Um, so about half our team are operating um, the hotline. We do calls and currently we accept chats. And we're also looking to um, uh, integrate text into our platform as well. Wow. You guys also operating in mm -hmm. indigenous languages? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And I think what's what's really unique, our value add in terms of hot, the hotline. Um, so for, ver for a very, very long time, we really haven't had good statistics on this issue for, for the obvious reasons. This is um, uh, crimes like sexual violence, intimate partner violence. Um, folks don't tend to report those. Um, and we know that communities who are most impacted by trafficking tend to be communities that um, have experienced marginalization um, and are less likely to go to the institutions, right? Who have, who've experienced some sort of community harm or historical harm from our institutions and so they're less likely to self-identify self-report so the, they, that it's kind of that issue where if policymakers can't see the issue it's very challenging to get funding to to really kind of turn eyeballs onto this um, so what's unique about the hotline is we're collecting data on the incidence of trafficking that is um, separate from the national statistics which is police reported data mm -hmm. police reported data is great um, but it really only gives us kind of tip of the iceberg when we're thinking about this issue. Do you have a guesstimate of, or is there a guesstimate of the number of people affected by human trafficking in Canada in a given year? I, I, I feel as though I may have heard a 50,000 statistic thrown around at one time. I don't know where that's from. I can't give you a, sure. a, a source. I don't know, Peter, do you, do you have a sense of something like that? Well, so 
when I was looking into before you were, before we did the show today, I was looking into just sort of numbers around because I'll tell you what one of my concerns is TikTok. Yes. Yeah. So here's a secret. If you're a white woman at a Walmart pushing a cart filled with craft dinner and tomato sauce, most likely you are not about to be trafficked. Right. And TikTok is filled with videos that open with oh my God, I was just almost trafficked. Right. And then on goes this sort of narrative. And I have, and it's, and, 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 and the difficulty I'm having, because we'll play a few clips from TikTok in a bit here. I love TikTok and I, and I can find, and the reason I love it is that we've been doing this show since April, 2020. Yes. We started it to talk about mental health and wellness and, and seeing this face every week. Um, just makes me feel better. Oh, and Brennan's as well. <laughs> I can see myself on the screen. Um, but uh, the reality is that I can find a TikTok no matter what our topic has been, right? Or who's on. Uh, right. That said, this episode was incredibly overwhelming because it was a mixture, right? Of like, and I mean hundreds, I scroll through hundreds of videos of um it's like oh, trauma dumping. Well, there was that. So there was a chunk of the trauma dumping, which you couldn't quite tell the authenticity. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to question it, but it just was like, I was hearing the same thing over and over again. But then this other thing about this, like Walmart particularly, like Walmart, like, so then it got me digging online. And lo and behold, the Walmart North Carolina, no one has ever been abducted from it. <laughs> Yet this narrative from 2015, mm -hmm. and it's still being perpetuated today. With and that particular Walmart? Well, that one and, and just Walmart in general. In and, in general. Oh. Like, and then I saw another video that said, do you know in Canada, 50,000 children have been taken? And then I went and looked, and 97% of those children were found in their own city, in their own home, within 20 blocks of their house, and they weren't taken. Mm -hmm. the majority of them just had left and weren't found and not to take away from the risks and challenges those kids face. Sure. But the narrative is being used in such a, and what's happening, I think is mm -hmm. all of that noise. Cause that's what those videos are is noise mm -hmm. are taking away from the real issue and the issue at hand. And, and misrepresenting the experience of survivors, right? Exactly. Is, um, and it's, it's, having people look for the wrong thing. So similar to what you're talking about, Peter, I've heard the the zip ties on your, your car door, door, door when you come back from, you know, the Walmart. You know what? Traffickers aren't, like, that's so much effort for a trafficker, right? Um, they're reaching out to folks on social media, particularly young people. Um, they know what they're looking for. The recipe is, like, tied and true, right? Um, it's almost like fishing, right? They're going to put out a lure and see who bites. Um, but they are looking to target people who are experiencing some sort of isolation or marginalization. Um, and it's a lot for them. The, the input or the effort is, is much less than having to abduct someone in a parking lot. Like, while that does happen, I'm not saying it doesn't, um, that's just not what we're seeing. Can I ask That's a question? That's really harmful, yeah. So most of the time, do you see that the person, um, or, like the victim is usually, like they wouldn't be able to recognize that person as like a stranger, like it would be someone that they know at that point or like yeah. have built a relationship yeah. with at that yeah. point? Yeah, so I think the, the again, to go back to the, the national statistics, but uh, of police report statistics, one in three survivors uh, we're trafficked by a current or intimate partner. So when we're thinking about sex trafficking specifically in Canada, um, it's typically looking like um, an in it, within an intimate partnership. Um, and then we also have uh, familial trafficking as well. So within the family, um, but it typically is looking like, um, you know, and, and we see also trafficking. Um, so like um, female to female trafficking. And oftentimes that is um, someone who is, has already experienced, been a victim of trafficking, who then starts to recruit on behalf of the trafficker. But for the, for the most part, it, it, sex trafficking typically is taking place in sort of like 
an illusion of a relationship. And that's why it's so difficult to really kind of tease those nuances apart, especially if, you know, you're a young person and we've all been young and we've all had times in our life where someone came along at the right time and said the right things and made you feel the right ways. Um, it's pretty easy to get swept up in that, right? Um, and traffickers, they know what to say and they know who, who to talk to, unfortunately. Yeah, and that's and that is the reality is that, and so those are the, it's the vulnerabilities which are often linked to race, often linked mm. to um, identity, to that marginalization, and if people if if people are being abducted and primarily women, because again it is primarily men as predators, women as uh, um, those who are experiencing this, and it's not to take away or because certainly, and. There's obvious evidence that men are experienced this as well, but Absolutely. primarily men are the um, uh, not just the not just the perpetrators in the initial engagement and the um, recruitment, but also in the purchasing and in the exploitation. Mm -hmm. But so, uh, oh, but when women in this country are taken against their will, it's mm -hmm. primarily and as it's quite often women who are living in marginalized neighborhoods, underserved neighborhoods, neighborhoods with crappy lights, neighborhoods that are unsafe passageways to save. Yet if I walk this way with the street lights, it'll take me 21 minutes. Right. If I walk this way where there's where no one has thought or wanted or committed to put street lights in, it'll take me seven minutes and I've got my kid at home and I haven't seen them since seven o'clock this morning when I went to work. Mm -hmm. that's the risk that women face right like that's the narrative and it's those and those women are primarily black indigenous um newcomers non-english speakers and but so in those abduction cases that are again not common in this not common in north america <laughs> um that is the population group so not that collective on tiktok who are just fanning these fears and and lots of them get guys on camera. I saw, and yeah, those dudes are creepy. Like there's no doubt about it. The dude at Walmart is creepy. <laughs> like mm -hmm. oh, certainly, and you should be aware of that. <clears throat> but and I'm not even suggesting like not to keep an eye on your kids or whatever, right? But of course he's creepy. But you know, but you like he's not there to traffic you, and uh, and so that terminology has become this sort of. And it's, and that was concerning to me because I had not seen that until, like, I hadn't searched. I like TikTok because I like dogs. I like dog videos. <laughs> I like, I miss the dancing that, like, was really the TikTok thing. Like, I miss that because that seems to have gone. And so watching, going down that pool today, which now I'm a little fearful of my algorithm. <laughs> like, mm, but, yeah. uh, but it's, uh, I'm going to have to tomorrow just search dogs all day. But, uh, <laughs> but the reality is that it's putting this negative, it's just, yeah. I, it was really concerning to me. It's going to be sitting with me now for the week. Is this conversation being had at the like highest levels of of you know policymakers and and people who are ha supposed to be having these conversations? Like, are politicians and you know like executives from organizations like the Center to End Human Trafficking like sitting down and having this discourse? Talking about misinformation specifically, Brennan. Yeah. Um, I don't know necessarily directly. So there, there's the Canadian Center for Child Protection, and, and they do a lot of work on child sexual abuse material online. Um, and, and I think there is definitely some intersections in our work. Um, but I think some of some of what we're doing at the center is we are just like, we are slowly trying to chip away at the lack of awareness of this issue just amongst the broader population and trying to share facts and share share real information um and it is really um scary to think that people are getting their information from instagram influencers or tiktokers or viral videos um that's really challenging because we know that when people are in a trafficking situation they're not recognizing what's happening to them is trafficking is a crime and so the more that we're exposing young people to misinformation, I think it actually is going to perpetuate harms more, right? And I think ultimately the trafficking movement really needs to 
you know, there's been so much focus on direct service and crisis stabilization service, which is absolutely important, and a lot of money put into criminal justice and law enforcement approaches. We're not going to arrest our way out of this. Um, we really need to figure out prevention. And to me, prevention really starts with education um, and ensuring that young people have the right information. Um, so I would say TikTok is not, not the place to get the information. Um, it is encouraging to see provinces like Ontario start to implement mandatory training on trafficking in all of the schools for all the teachers and administrators. Um, that's a great first step. We'd love to see something like that replicated across the provinces. Um, I think schools are a really great place for people to get that information. Um, but it also, these conversations need to happen at the dinner table as well. Mm. Uh, um, is a, this is a little bit uh, not off topic, but um, is, um, is this like um, put in with, with this topic, the, um, the act of like uh, when people like, continuously like take photos of their children and stuff and like sell that stuff online like and kind of entrap them like is that the same stuff or is that a different issue um i think what you're talking about like online exploitation if there's a commercial okay. element absolutely would would be tra considered trafficking um there are conversations around um, I know we're kind of getting a little off topic here, but the rise of kind of like uh, YouTube families and and children not necessarily being consenting to having their whole lives documented on the internet forever. Um, and I actually recently read that um, some youth uh, somewhere in the US, I don't know which state, so forgive me, but have um, introduced a bill to allow minors to opt out of that if their parents are oversharing and i thought that was amazing young people decided cool. that they wanted to protect young people because you know um once the algorithm has all of our faces from facebook and instagram it's on there forever forever and ever um and babies and young children um aren't able to consent to that yet yeah yeah it's yeah. a it's a real challenge that we're gonna have to start to have conversations so, about so how like I mean, how young is too young to have these conversations? Because, like, I'm I'm thinking of these, like, you know, like there was a local case not too long ago where there was a very similar thing happened in one of our communities, and and these, you know, these kids were very different age ranges, mm -hmm. um, and so like, you know, like how like so for me, like if I'm, I do youth engagement, right, and my, I work mm. with youth up to like twelve and up. Um, but like, like, how does someone like me bring this into my programming and, and in a safe, you know, productive way and like, like even just get this awareness on the table and the conversation started without, I don't know, just without bringing any negativity or sure. anything. Sure. And without preaching, right? Like you yeah. don't want to be talked at. Um, yeah. That's a really great question. I think um, there's, a, there's a few things that come to mind. So I don't know if you're working primarily with, with young men or young women or both, but both. Um, there's the moose hide campaign. I don't know if you've heard about mm -hmm. that. Um, that's really talking about uh, the role of, of um, respect and anti-violence within indigenous communities, especially focusing on the role of young men. Um, there's the white ribbon campaign, excuse me, um, again, similar focus on doing the right thing, um, empowering young men to, to say no to all of the things they should. Um, but I think when you're talking to youth, one of the best things that I've seen sort of just in the last kind of six years is there's some really incredible, powerful youth leaders who are doing prevention work. Um, and so like, it's not gonna resonate coming necessarily from someone like me, but if they can kind of see themselves in that young person who's had that experience or who's had a similar experience, I find that can be really powerful. Um, the other thing I think, too, is um, if there are comic books or movies that have that kind of like story element that's appealing to a young person, um, but is sharing the information in a way that's not a, a lecture or a lesson is can be really powerful as well. Cool. Thank you. And welcome to why we love Brennan, because those questions are so helpful, right? It's so mm -hmm. it, it is. And the answer in your, in your yeah, I can see. Uh, um how it is that the center has grown so successfully just listening to you share 
Um, I think there is, and you are right, because one of the issues, I think the very core of it is about helping men figure out, because this is a men's issue. Mm-hmm. Like it's everybody's yeah, it is, issue. It, it is, but I but I mean, but it's a men's issue in the sense that men need to be having these conversations with each other. Uh-huh. And it is hard. And holding each other accountable. Yeah. And that's really hard. Some if someone in your group is involved with something like this, like check them on it. Like yeah. yeah. But and even the conversations before they like like just the <clears throat> Because and it doesn't matter who you are, man or male or female, is that it's hard to challenge people in your life who you care about mm-hmm. and who or who you don't want to upset or you don't want to offend or you don't like it is hard. It's hard business. Like this is, mm-hmm. but and and there are so many things that, and especially for folks my age that thought we thought were okay, like in the way we talk or behave. Sure. At one point we've suddenly heard and listened, not suddenly, but we've heard and listened that these things are not okay, right? And the way we talk about women as an example, right? The way we talk about women, um, the language we use, the jokes that are made, and and by no means am I removed from that pool, right? Like, and and I assume nor are any of us, and I don't mean just like, because again, we're human beings, right? And we got raised in a way where this was okay, and this was, and and the difficulty is that once we realize that this is not okay, how do we? And we might stop the behavior. The next step is okay. What do we do when we witness the behavior? And that's where white ribbon and both both white ribbon and the moose hide campaign we've worked with in the past, both of them, and they're so important. Like they're just they're critical, but. It's it is the day to day how to do it, which is really really tough. That's and, sorry, didn't you? No, go go. Like that's. I was just gonna say that's so important too. Is like, I mean, even like, like just having the conversation of noticing the differences and being able to actually identify that situation when it's happening, versus like, oh, like that's just two people like going through their thing. Leave them. Don't don't get into. Don't get involved with them. Blah blah. You know what I mean? Like, but you never like if you're. It could be something totally different. You have no idea if you don't. Yeah, it's just like that. That conversation definitely needs to be had because that, like, that is something that I see brought up all the time. It's like, oh, like, don't ever involve yourself with someone else because you might just get burnt. You know what I mean? Like, so, like if you see like a domestic situation. Yeah, or- yeah, like something like that, or even just people like, yeah, like verbally domestic, right? Like, even people you know, right? Someone you might know, like stuff like that. Well, so it's like, awkward because it's awkward, right? Someone's yeah. like a partner, they're going at it. And and it's and A, it's triggering for a lot of people, right? Mm-hmm. So number one, you yourself are like, wait a second, I'm feeling insecure now. I'm feeling like my security's at risk. I'm feeling all these feelings. Mm-hmm. And I know that. So A, you're trying to navigate, <laughs> then how do you actually then intervene when I'm already feeling like heightened and so now, okay, so how do, so now I've breathed through it. So now I'm going to, like, it's continuing and I don't want it to escalate. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, it is. And part of it is learning how to walk through it, right? Like learning how to, and practicing it. This is what we, the work we do a lot, actually, with the young people is we get them to practice stuff. Like, so they go up to each other and sometimes it's as simple as telling someone that they matter to them, Right. And we get them to do it over and over again. And we, we did a project in the North and we, the young people, uh, we had the young men and the young women uh, uh, write verses of songs. Um, and in fact, you know what we might do today? We're going to skip the TikToks because they kind of. <laughs> the first show ever. Well, maybe we'll still, maybe we'll still. We'll get <laughs> But uh can we share something with you? An example of what I think Please. this is yeah, actually, I think the, uh, I think this is kind of the path that because we have to find those ways to have those conversations. Um, we just have to. And the difficulty in the world is that it is really hard to get there. And this song was created because someone was sharing, um, someone was sharing their experiences and it was pretty challenging and, and the young people in the moment 
they were listening, but they weren't listening. They were, they were being young people, right? Like they were being teenagers while someone was talking at an event. So they weren't being jerks. They were just, they were just being, being kids, just being kids and not in the worst way. And, but what it did was generated a really powerful conversation about what it, uh, um, let's just get this here. So sorry about, uh, about the value and the importance of young men particularly stepping up and understanding their role and so they wrote and produced this and it's called beautiful and it came out of north caribou lake first nation youth week and uh, and this amazing group of young people we've had the privilege to work with them and watch them grow up and they're in fact joey joey q do you remember joey q Brandon? she flew off to iceland today what no yeah. way that's crazy and and again oh, just, so you know, just, awesome. so you, just so you know just so you know actually like for our young people who live in remote communities to be traveling like that like that's a huge deal right like it's a and she had been to peru earlier and she's off to iceland wow. now and like and she was one of the young women who wrote this song and uh so this is uh this is beautiful written and performed by uh the youth from North Caribou, and we're going to play it for you. And I think this is, and I hadn't thought of it until now, but this is the path um, that I think how we get to this next stage. whistle at night oh we're not actually you're right oh bad medicine you know it's a smudge you know i never heard that the whistling thing until i came to kingston yeah in, and it's not i, used to, I used to like i was gonna say i used to walk around at night whistling and so <laughs> like now i'm just like so scared to do it yeah the little people come out the mischief um 
the uh, but that song, I think we need to find, and I haven't watched that in forever, but I think we need to get the lyrics on the, I don't think any of us had the skill set at the time to do that and barely, I barely have it now, but I think we need to put oh, the lyrics sick. on the bottom, but the, basically the message is that young, like <laughs> young men wrote these, the, their, their, their lyrics, right? about how they could see women and what they needed to tell women in their lives their their sisters because they're because again in small in smaller communities their sisters cousins they're all our relations right so and uh and that is the path i think is to have those conversations that sometimes stem out of a difficult scenario right mm -hmm. it was that there was a lot of sort of someone was sharing their experience and there was just a lot of and it was discomfort is what it was right because people are uncomfortable it's hard to hear people's hard stories and if you don't know how to cope with what you're hearing then me joking with brennan might be what i might naturally do right sure. and uh i would like to think that's not where brennan and i are at today but it's <laughs> just to put in the universe it's just so it doesn't i'm not suggesting that's what we do today but it's a natural outcome and and one of the difficulties is sometimes when that happens people don't know how to respond to it right they get angry they say oh you shouldn't they like because it's hard it's hurtful right mm -hmm. but the reality is that if we can meet young people with where they're at and help them get to a place i think that is the the piece and looking at that video what was really cool is those young folks are so many of them are now high school graduates um they are working in the community uh 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 lucius who saw, saw, saw him there i saw like right before the show he's running a hockey tournament tonight like or a skating tournament whatever it was a tournament in the community like this is five years later and they're all working in their community to make it a better place because for the cool. young ones now and uh and and i think that those when we talk about trafficking and how to prevent it it looks like that i think like that's what it looks like it's it's it is about taking the time to build relationships with young people to have the conversations that are difficult um and help them understand because it's in in them to to be kind and caring and and our, our communities are historically matriarchal right pre-colonization and pre-contact and so it's helping them see that and that's if you saw the ones the warriors who rock like my warrior they were all women right yeah Yep. <laughs> and that wasn't intentional, mm -hmm. but the reality is that that was the, that was the case, right? So, yeah. It's cool because um, you're like, you're teaching them to recognize an issue and like deal with it in a good, healthy way and then do something productive with it, like with that yeah. energy. That's really cool. The, uh, no, no, no. I was just going to ask you, uh, Ashley. So the, um, the center and its growth has now had, and now, now you've got this, this the, the, the hotline. Mm -hmm. And so how many calls do you, do you know, do you have a guesstimate of how many calls the hotline either gets or has received or? Um, I don't have a sense of daily call volume, but I will say that last year we did a national awareness campaign uh, right ahead of February 22nd next week, which is National Human Trafficking Awareness Day. Um, and we really focused that campaign on trying to, to reach people who are actually impacted. A lot of our work has been raising awareness just generally, but really we're really trying to target individuals who are who are likely experiencing some sort of exploitation trafficking. Um, and we really focus that campaign around healthy relationships. What is a healthy relationship? what isn't a healthy relationship. And you can kind of muddy the waters a little bit there with IP intimate partner violence. Um, but we thought that that was the really great way to message so that folks understand what really are able to recognize what isn't healthy. Um, but uh, um, the outcome of that campaign was a 50% increase of calls to the hotline. Wow. Um, and that has stayed pretty stable through the year. Um, so we're expecting that this this February leading into next week, um, we've chosen to really highlight labor trafficking this year. No one else is really doing that work on a national level. I think um, sex trafficking for a very good reason gets sort of the lion's share of conversation and focus mm -hmm. and attention. Um, so we are really trying to talk about labor trafficking at a national level this year. Um, and just 6% of our calls to the hotline were about labor trafficking. So we also think that that is very, very unreported in terms of what is actually occurring in the country. So 
um, it's anyone's guess in terms of, you know, those numbers. Can you tell us about what labor trafficking looks like in Canada? Sure, sure. Um, so for just to, so we're all kind of same shared foundation knowledge, um, sex trafficking for the majority tends to impact people who are Canadian, who live in Canada, who are permanent residents, um, whereas labor trafficking tends to impact uh, folks who are foreign nationals, migrant workers. Um, and it's really, it's the exploitation of another person for their labor or their service um, for some sort of uh, financial or, or you know, uh, personal gain. Um, so in Canada, we have the Temporary Foreign Worker Program, which was established in the 70s with uh, between the Canadian government and foreign governments, which allows essentially fast tracking foreign workers in to fill um, job vacancies in the labor market. And so to, originally it was for high, highly skilled laborers. And it's now really, um, it's more low wage, low skill uh, workers that now come in. So we definitely see them coming in um, manufacturing, forestry, hospitality, construction, agricultural processing, domestic work. Um, those are kind of the big sectors. Um, the issue I think for migrant workers specifically is they don't have the same rights and they don't have the status that you and I do here in Canada. They don't have the language. So there's social, cultural isolation that they experience. And so they're, they're unfortunately much more easily taken advantage of once they're here. And so, and I think back to COVID and the farms in Southern Ontario, mm -hmm. I think about those conditions mm -hmm. and, and one of the realities, so is, is, would this be a correct narrative of, of, of labor trafficking is that someone may come to Canada willingly. Oh yeah. And once they arrive though, Yes. They no longer have, they've lost control of their ability to say yes or no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and victimized via wages, right? Yes. Um, passport uh, held. Passport, there, someone holds their passport. Because here's the secret, right? Anytime someone asks you to hold your passport, or not asks, tells you that they're going to hold your passport. Red flag. <laughs> yes, right? Like, and that's that's really actually, I would think one of the major major definitions, would it not be like- your, Oh, absolutely. Or your phone or your wallet. If they're trying to tell you that you can't talk to family or see certain people like red flag, red flag. Yeah. Um, but, you know, typically migrant workers, those who are being exploited are here legitimately. They come through legitimate pathways. They come under various worker programs. Um, so it's it's not this idea that people are sneaking in or being smuggled in or they're here illegally. While some folks do lose status because of their trafficking, um, it's really people here who are here legally to essentially prop up our economy, who are taking the jobs that a lot of us don't want. And and, and so this is really, and maybe this is bold, but government sanctioned labor trafficking. Uh, well, it is a federal, it is a federal uh, program that is administered through the provinces. So you, yeah, you could say that. Yeah. And so, and, and one of the things, and I think certainly in Ontario, the farms come to my mind immediately. Sure. Yes. And, and I don't think a lot of Canadians understand that when they pick their tomatoes from Loblaws or No Frills or Food Basics or Sobeys or wherever, mm -hmm that there's a good chance those tomatoes were a product of someone's pretty brutal exploitation. And again, when the COVID crisis hit, I kind of had hope for the migrant workers mm -hmm. that because they were, because again, uh, and Brendan, you might not have seen this, but in Southern Ontario, they're like the housing conditions were brutal. So these spaces where they 12, still are. 24, 36, <laughs> they still are. yeah, well, and nothing changed, right? No. So people were getting COVID and, and dying right, yeah. because they also didn't have access to medical care. Mm -hmm. And the reality was that nothing changed. So th this is the homeless camps in Ontario, right? No, no, no. These are the, the people picking the tomatoes. Oh. Or, or corn or whatever it is agriculturally, right? Jeez. It's, yeah. That's and, horrible. And, and nothing has shifted. Um, 
And I kind of, I remember watching it and thinking how horrible it was to watch that, but thinking at the same time, well, thank goodness people are finally seeing this. Yeah, I think it definitely uh, raised the profile of, of the conditions that migrant workers have been under for years and years and years. Um, unfortunately, you're right, there hasn't been a, a ton of action. I will say the federal government has implemented um, open work permits. So if an, a migrant worker can prove that they were being abused and exploited in the workplace, they can apply for an open work permit. Um, so, Only you know, there are, prove. unfortunately, yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's a it's adjudicated by a, um, someone at the federal government. Um, so there are, there are small things, but as an organization, we are pushing for open work permits for all migrant workers. That can, gives you us, us, can you tell us what an open work permit is? Oh yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Um, so migrant workers who come in through all of the various streams are given a work permit that ties them to a specific employer. So if, if you're being abused, um, you have no mobility. So if your employer is abusing you, you're not allowed to go to the farm down the road. You're, you're, you're stuck, right? Um, so if you're being abused in Canada, you can apply for the open work permit. You can be granted that. There's a whole bureaucratic process. But then you can leave and you can go work somewhere else. Um, we are saying let's prevent the exploitation, like, like chop it off at the knees, grant migrant workers empower them and give them mobility so that when they when it starts to kind of veer into those slow kind of abuses before we're in full-blown exploitation allow them to leave and have mobility um so that that's that's something that we're really kind of hoping the government will will think about i don't know if there's another jurisdiction in, in the entire world who's doing that um for a whole host of reasons i think that racism um, <laughs> yep. Uh, I think there's a whole, uh, there are concerns about what you do when you empower migrant workers, right? Who, who aren't residents or permanent residents or Canadians. Will they unionize? What does that mean for our cheap labor, right? That is you can't exploit up... them anymore. Right. <laughs> so, you know, this, uh, the system works to, um, it works to the advantage of some and the disadvantage of others. And I don't, with all of our systems. I don't see a real desire to, to change those systems, unfortunately. And, and it is such a sin because I think about it and and you're right, because at the end of the day, it's about dollars and cents and a lack of respect and racism. <laughs> like all of that rolled in. Because I think what what people are, are concerned about probably, I would be my assumption is that the migrant worker then goes freely and stays underground or whatever right like doesn't leave at the end because because these work permits are tied to dates right like you come in here you leave here and so like that's just so much hurdles on its own yeah 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 and i think that idea of like they're coming to you know they're, that horrible racist idea that they're coming to steal our jobs like there are migrant workers who come into canada for eight months a year they leave their families they leave their communities they work here for 15, 20 years, and then they have they have nothing, right? Um, they don't have any pathways for residency here. Maybe they want to bring their families. Maybe they want to start life here. Um, it's yeah, it's it's really unfortunate. Yeah, it is. It's I think about it often. I really genuinely do because I like I have a few things on my plate already in life, so it's not something that I can really focus on, but. Mm. I really struggle because I know, and I'm being genuine too. Like I go to no, I went to no frills the other day because uh, peppers were on sale. Mm -hmm. And if those peppers are coming from Canada, I know that the only reason they're on sale is that they're paying these workers subpar wages, mm -hmm. less than minimum wage. They're taking from that wage accommodations, which is subpar accommodations. <laughs> They're taking food and meals, subpar meals. Like we know what is happening. Mm -hmm. I spent a good chunk of Barbados or of COVID in Barbados and mm -hmm. uh, and had the opportunity to listen and learn a lot more about slavery in the island and and how that from the from from the uh, uh, enslaved workers to like, and it doesn't sound very different 
than what these workers are experiencing. And it can be again in forestry, in the fisheries, in mm -hmm. like, and and the reality is that when Canadians say, oh, they're coming to take our jobs, no, they're not, because your kids aren't taking those jobs. <laughs> yeah. Your, yeah. Your, your kids <laughs> are at home at 22 playing Xbox. <laughs> And they are not picking tomatoes for 12 hours a day. No. No. We grew up in an area that was like a tomato farmy area. And everybody worked there. Every high school kid worked there. Every like, well, that doesn't happen anymore. No. And and it doesn't happen for two reasons. It doesn't happen because the kids don't want those jobs. My mom used to work at the tomato factory, at the canning factory. Mm. And holy mother of goodness, did she smell bad when she came home? Like it was gross. Like our whole town smelled gross in August. And that's hard, and that's really hard work. Yeah, and and hard, hard work, and hard, honest work. And the and the and the difficulty is that so a Canadians aren't taking those jobs, and b they're not actually even being offered them or encouraged them because the the migrant workers we paid less by the farm. And these aren't, and I want to be very clear, these aren't farmers. Like, these are not like John's. They're compounds. They're compounds owned by industry. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the other part of this. Yeah. This isn't Joe Farmer who's got, who, who like pulls up his sleeves and yeah. his wife is he's drowning in debt and he's yeah, working, like working this, up. Yeah, this is not every day. Joe, and not to say that Joe Farmer doesn't do this, because but, but these are the ones who take these permits, my understanding. Is these are corporations? They're they're typically bigger bigger operations, and and you're right. Um, and that's not to say that every employer is exploiting their workers, but um, it just this is this is a significant serious issue in this country um, that Canadians just are not aware of. Like I think sex trafficking, we hear about it enough in popular culture and. You see human trafficking, I see it all the time in the news, um, but we really like, this is below our level of consciousness of the labor trafficking in this country. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So I do hope that uh, things will shift and I'm grateful that you and the center are, Thank you. Um, are working on this because I think it matters. Like, I do think that the model, I understand we need folks and, most certainly <laughs> like we mm -hmm. need, we do need them but i do also think the uh um at the end of the day we have to find out how to do it in a healthier and a safer in a more respectful way like and even to the point of um how we honor them right for the what they're bringing to this country Right. Like, and not, in fact, because we know that many of them will experience racism while they're here. Um, like, we just know that to be truth, right? That if you're not white in Canada, like we believe we're different than America. We like to present ourselves, but it's not fundamentally different. And uh, and at the end of the day, it is uh, um it's making sure that they are paid wages. Like the, the government program, if my understanding is that they actually have to pay them sort of a median wage of what's on the job bank for these jobs, right? Like in theory. Um, and it is actually within the wage range that you're paying other employees, right? So if you've got that 20 year old, that 20 year person you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Should be making the same range as the the far the worker who's Canadian and working there like by by the policies like by the policies of the of the program and uh at the end of the day I just don't know if that's happening right like I just don't know and and there needs to be a way for Canadians to know because I like because we have to be able to do something for sure and I think um it, this is one of those hard conversations when we think about trafficking exploitation globally there's there's no parts of our lives that is not impacted by exploitation in the supply chain at some point I know this is like this is a hard conversation to have but everything everything we buy your if you have an iPhone someone somewhere the battery or the you know pieces of this iPhone were mined with slave labor it is it touches all of us and and I also think you know we have to have 
conversations about what kind of country we want, right? Um, and think about the sacrifices that these people are making. And um, yeah, like uh, that, I think Canadians tell themselves this story about the country. And we're really having hard conversations about Canadian, I, Canadian identity and, and who we are. And this is part of our story and it's not a pretty part of our story. It's an ongoing part. Um, and we need to have those honest, hard conversations about it. Most certainly it is, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, um, I, did, I mean, first of all, I just wanna thank you for like all the work you're doing, it's insane. Um, but, um, I want to know, like, how do you keep yourself from not being burnt out? Like just, just talking about all this stuff mm. and thinking about it every day. Like, how do you take care of yourself? Let alone it being your like main purpose, not your main purpose in life, but like your, you know, it's your, it's your career is what you revolve your life around. So again, I just want to ask, like, how do you take care of yourself? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I will say um my colleagues on the hotline who are taking those calls and really deep in that emotional work um that they have really like the work they are doing is 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 much harder in terms of that emotional content um for me i i love being outdoors um i love photography um and i also sometimes i know this is, sounds funny but um what i do day to day the subject matter is really heavy so at night, if I want to watch TV, I turn my brain off and I have to just watch garbage. It has to nice. be reality TV. It has to be like <laughs> the trashiest. Um, but I think for me, that's my escape. And I just it's it's like so different from work. And it's it's not asking me to turn on my brain or turn on my heart. Um, and so it's a kind of a good balance between like really kind of like fluffy stuff and really heavy stuff that I deal with during during the week. Awesome. Thank you. Sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Totally. I am all about TV. Mm -hmm. it, That's like, my favorite thing to do. Yeah. Some people have other hobbies, right? And I sometimes get jealous of them. Like I look at the people and I'm like, they you know they do things. And I, like, <laughs> jealous momentarily. And and I'm the master of like, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna sign up for this course, like this class. Mm -hmm. And then I never go. <laughs> like and, but and I, doing nothing is self-care it is oh totally, exactly right oh, like yeah. self-care looks different Amen. to everyone and sometimes doing nothing feels amazing exactly and That's just i lean into that <laughs> no 100 because uh because you can yeah because i get to that place where i'm just like oh i want to be like that person no i want to watch law and order <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome. So here, can we ask a couple quick questions? Sure. Fun facts. What's your favorite food in the whole wide world? Oh man. Um I am a really I like I really love chocolate, but milk chocolate, Cadbury's from the UK, uh really nice stuff. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. But I would say coffee is like a close second. I, I really like good coffee. And you so need to go to Peru. Okay. <laughs> chocolate, they real chocolate and chocolate coffee. Nice. Um, I, I was going to quickly pull up a great picture of uh, Brennan, but I'll just tell you about it, of him wearing <laughs> burnt chef's hat while we made chocolate in Peru. Amazing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. They, they, they said the local people there, they have dark chocolate every day, and they said it does wonders for your aging. Oh, yeah. Antioxidants. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay, so chocolate and coffee, and what's your definition of good coffee? Um, I have an espresso at home, which is like, <sighs> you know, nice. if it comes to my front door, I don't have to leave the house for it. Yeah. Uh, it's not very environmentally sound, so, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I am one of those rare people that do like flavored coffee, which can be very controversial, uh, but I like flavored coffee. <laughs> so, so I I had tonight I drink tea I've got okay. this horrible allergic reaction to coffee like oh no caffeine and coffee and it happened one day years ago and put me in an ultimate panic attack oh wow which actually resulted in me locking myself into an airplane bathroom but nonetheless a whole other <laughs> but I uh, drink a lot of tea and uh, I love flavored teas and uh, and you know my favorite thing is is that 
home sense, you get those no sugar, sugar free. Oh, nice. And I've been sober a long, long time. And I used to, in my old life, have a beautiful bar. Now I've got a beautiful bar of sugar-free syrups. Oh, amazing. <laughs> yeah. The addiction is pretty the sweet. Addiction, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, the addiction Great. is gone. It's still there. Like, it's just a different sort. Now it's sugar-free syrups. It's like a little Starbucks section. It it's really like, is. It looks like It's, that, it's yeah. just missing the cash re- register. Amazing. Yeah. Um, okay, so that was your favorite food. So favorite food, chocolate, milk, cabaret, chocolate. Yeah, I can see that. That makes good sense. And coffee. Um, a movie that you would recommend any that everyone you think should watch. Oh, that's a tough one. Um, hmm. I don't. Okay, can I choose a television show? Yeah. Instead. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm the type of person, I don't like to read a book or watch a movie twice. If I know the story, I don't, I can't do it. But I recently rewatched Game of Thrones all the way through. And, I, and I've read the books as well. Um, and that's not light, fluffy content, like I said. So I'm contradicting myself. Yeah. However, I was as engrossed the second time as the first time. So I would, I would wow. suggest Game of Thrones. Have you watched House of Dragon? I have, yes. Oh, nice. <laughs> it's really, nice. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Well, very exciting. That's that's interesting because I too am not a movie watcher more than once. Like I might watch it like ten again. There's now movies that I watched 35, 40 years, 45 sure. years ago. So if I <laughs> 45 years ago, I might watch it again now. But on Brennan's recommendation, last was it last weekend we went? Last weekend we went to go see Titanic. Oh nice. Oh, nice. 25th anniversary. <laughs> and I can't lie, I smiled through the entirety of the movie. I was just like Did you cry at the end? No, but I'll tell you what happened. This is an interesting <laughs> narrative. Well, no, another story. Another day for that story. But I <laughs> it was absolutely, I just loved it. And I literally within seconds of that beginning scene, I was ear to ear smile. And it was cool because it was in 3D and 10,000 k or whatever it is. Or, and it did look great. And it was and nice. Oh, the audio is so good in the theater. And I probably watched it last maybe 15 years ago, maybe. Right. Uh, and then because I saw it in the theater potentially more than once. Leo and I are like just days apart in age. <laughs> and so I always do believe that one day we will. One I can day, see it. I can see day, it. 100%. One day he'll take the restraining order off and I will be able, <laughs> be able to marry me. Um, but uh, so... Uh, Brennan, I'm going to ask you the same question, favorite movie TV yeah. show, but I will first answer the question of what's his favorite food, because it's just embarrassing. It is, uh, Bert, are you looking, do you have scraps? I was, I was going to say, I had it like an hour ago. Burger King, <laughs> Burger King poutine. Which, oh, good uh, one. Which this, but I want to be very clear. I've made him beef tenderloin. Yeah, let it cool off. We've eaten great food all over the world. This is his favorite food, Burger King poutine, <laughs> but not hot. After it's congealed, okay, like it gets grosser by the second. So after it's congealed, <laughs> and like, and I'll watch him. Uh, we'll be sitting on the couch, and I'm watching him eat this, and my head is going to explode. I'm like, "How are you even eating it?" Like his fork goes in, and like, bangs the whole thing comes out. Yes. <laughs> nice. so, Take a bite off, put it back in like a chicken. I've been shaming him <laughs> forever, and he doesn't even change his mind. Favorite movie, Brandon? Of like, what movie or what movie would you recommend to people? Um, Armageddon, Michael Bay's movie. Oh, yeah, hey. Bruce Willis. Oh, a little um, uh, Aerosmith. Yeah, amazing soundtrack. That is an amazing soundtrack in that yeah. movie. I, I watched that maybe during COVID, I think. Maybe. Was, that was one of the movies I had on VHS. I just watch it over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> and Res, um, Res Life. I've got to watch yeah. VHS. And, uh, but for a show, it was definitely Community. All-time oh, favorite oh, yes. show. I could watch that all day, every day. So Brennan is someone who does watch things over and over. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. in the same week, more than once. I think there's yeah, something therapeutic about that. You know what to expect. It's calming. No surprises. I, oh, get, yeah. I get that. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And you, yeah, you're like anticipating the moment because you know it's coming and certain yeah. stuff like Hobbit, Lord of the Rings. Yeah. I got a big old movie collection. and <laughs> I love rewatching shows, rewatching movies. My favorite thing. And I only watched The Hobbit for the first time during COVID. I had never seen any of them before. And did you like them? I loved them. I watched them all. We watched so all three of them in one day. I'm going yeah, they're, on an they're adventure. They're pretty majestic. Um, yeah. They're really well done. 
Yeah. So good. Um, so we asked their food favorite. Uh, um, all right. Guilty pleasure. Um, so I have a little one at home. He's he's two. So right now in my world, my guilty pleasure is downloading a podcast and just going out for a walk. Just me putting my AirPods in, just being quiet time, just me. Um, I don't have a lot of time to myself anymore <laughs> as a parent of a young child. So anytime I can get a little bit of time for me is, is nice. Awesome. 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 And uh, um, yeah, that's fantastic. Smartless. I'd recommend that podcast. Okay. If you haven't seen it, I would recommend it. I haven't. It. No, let me write that down. Smartless. It is uh, absolutely fantastic. It is, uh, you know who it is. It's, uh, um, well, you don't know because you don't know the podcast, but let me just get, uh, uh, Christ, what's their name? Uh, Jason Bateman, Jason John B Hayes, oh, okay. and Will Arnett. Okay, yeah. yes. I think I've listened to maybe an episode or two. Yeah, and it's so good. And they're so, and what I love about them, we're trying, we have Simon is trying to find them in the world. Because I would love to have them on the show, not because they're celebrities, blah, 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 but because they've, they're such good friends and they're mm. such a demonstration of what friendship could look like, like mm. where they certainly care for each other. They tell each other they care for each other. They'll still tease the shit out of each other, like back and forth. Yeah. But yeah. It is uh, absolutely brilliant. Was Jason uh, Bateman the one that did Ozark? Yeah. Yes. Ozark, yeah, yeah. Oh, that show is insane. Mm -hmm. It is insane. Uh, and guilty pleasure for you, Brennan? I don't know. I was trying to think. I'm even like, what even defined as guilty pleasure? Yeah, you have very little shame. So you eat. The yeah. <laughs> oh, Burger King. Eating Burger King. <laughs> Burger King poutine. Um, Fast food, DoorDash. I'm trying to think what my guilty pleasure is. I uh, maybe French fries. Ooh, like okay. I really try to watch what I eat. I don't do a very good job of it. And when I finish this it tonight. It'll even be more cemented, but um, but I think French fries are like where I just I feel bad. I know that I shouldn't eat them because of my health, and but I just love so them good. so much. And I literally have eaten them in the car and like gotten rid of the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think that qualifies as a guilty pleasure. Yeah, I think so. No, Peter, are you like? Do you like a crispy fry, or are you like Brennan? You like a soggy fry? crispy crispy these okay. ones there's a there's a, a, a it's not new it's new to me because they've recently built a bridge over the the river where i live so i can go now in five minutes get these french fries that are so good and uh eight out of ten of them are ex like perfect fries two out of ten sometimes like it's a little bit whatever but actually it has been absolutely delightful to uh spend some time with you tonight and uh, i uh i am grateful for the work that you and everyone else is doing at the center and everyone else that's been there from barb on right barb was the first as you worked mm -hmm. with barb originally right mm -hmm. and, uh um the work of the task force um i've done some really cool stuff in my life i've been really privileged and uh and uh yeah but the task force was probably some of the most significant learning i'd ever had the privilege to do i couldn't believe and again, I remember getting there and I talked about it there. So it's not a secret just about the imposter syndrome of why am I here? Mm. I was at a table with 35, 40 of the most brilliant women in the country. Like, I don't know how many, I think 35, something like that sound right. I don't know. It was a lot of us with very large tables and uh, the most brilliant women and many of whom are still my dear, dear friends. And uh, in the video there from the North, yeah, I don't know if you saw Sheila North was there. She was at that table, I think. I'm certain of it, right? And uh, I think that's where we originally met was at the task force, I think. Um, I could be wrong, but I think so. Long and short of it, it uh, was one of the most significant contributions that I could make in that space. And uh, I, uh, I will always be grateful that those recommendations came out and I'll always be grateful that there was a sticking to it because there has been this movement from when that originally occurred and there are conversations in this sector um that I still am not on board with <laughs> like I just can't be and probably won't ever be and uh I uh I believe that we always need to evolve when we learn more 
Um, but at the same time, I also believe that we have to stand up for what we know to be true. And uh, so I'm grateful that the center does that. I'm grateful that the center has a phone line so that when someone knows that, when someone is able to make that call, mm -hmm. either because they've got the capacity emotionally or physically or spiritually or mentally, when they're at that moment that there is somewhere in this country that they can call and uh, and hopefully find a path out. And uh, because it's hard. And so many of our sisters and our aunties and our mothers and our grannies and our nieces and daughters just never were able to get there. And so uh, I hope that phone number is on stickers all over, graffitied all over this country. Me too. That when, uh, when people need to know and are able to, yeah. they can pick up the phone. And it's, I'm glad to hear that there's someone there to pick it up when they call so thank you to you and all the good work you're doing. And you. uh, um, please do say hello to your mother. I will, I, uh, absolutely. I, uh, again, absolutely love her to death. And uh, um, I'm so grateful to uh, um, her, both in that task force, but years and years earlier, many years before that, when I met her originally. And uh, um, yeah, Brett and Gugu, you are, as always, the very best. And uh, Saturdays are so much better with you in it. And that's even nice. Like, and I spent the day with the land council today, which was awesome. And uh, a group. Who, sorry? But the land council today. Oh, nice. And so oh, I, awesome it's a group of grandmothers who are caring for the planet in the best, beautiful, beautiful way. And uh, and I had the privilege to spend the day with them. And uh and uh, but yeah, tomorrow night we're having Sunday dinner. I wish you were going to be here, Brennan, so badly. I'll tell them all. I say hi. I will tell everyone you said hi, Ashley. <laughs> thank you so much. We're going to post you. this on YouTube so you can find it there. And uh, my friends at home, yesterday, Friday, Friday was National at Random Act of Kindness Day. You don't need a day to be kind. Like, be nice to yourself first of all, because here's the mm -hmm. secret: you're not a total turkey, and. Uh, and if you pray nice to yourself, then it's going to be easier to be nice to someone else. And uh, and kindness totally free. Like kindness is a text to someone. It's a text to a stranger or not a stranger. That's weird and creepy. It's a text to someone you haven't spoken to in a while. It's a it's a phone call to someone that you care about. It's a note. It's a Star Wars figurine on a car. Sorry, collectible on a car. Um, whatever it looks like, just be kind. Because when you're kind, it just fills you up. And uh, and if you're finding yourself to be cranky and miserable and kind of a jerk face, just try. Just try to be kind. And you'll watch and feel the weight of all that crankiness dissipate. And it won't, maybe not forever or maybe not completely, but it'll lessen a little. And you deserve a life that's a little easier. We all do. And uh, so until next Saturday night, we will uh, see you uh, then, right, Mr. Guru? Yeah, we'll see you uh, there. Ashley, I look forward to one day getting the chance to meet you in real life. But yes, I, will, I would love uh, that. <laughs> but I will take uh, Zoom any day. And uh, to our friends at home who are watching, I lost the page. I don't know where that went. I want to, <laughs> the last thing we're going to do, here we go. The last thing we're going to do is just give some folks some links here so they can see really quickly. Uh, where is it? This is going to get weird because there's Facebook. But we're going to go here. This is the center's website. So... I don't know. If, can you see this? Did I ruin? Yeah, I, I can see it. Yep. All right. Perfect. Um, so here's the center's website. For some reason. Ah, there we go. <laughs> and uh, so check them out here. Get in touch. There is the number for the hotline right there. And uh, um, make sure that you share this number on social media. Uh, make sure you don't share mistruths. You can contact them here as well. You can report a tip online. You can send them an email. There's some... Uh, uh, referral directory if you're looking for some support and lastly tonight i am wearing this beautiful flourish and grow shirt i yes, sure everyone cool. is envious it is michaela Stevens, our uh pal drives the comic man's sister and uh, look at her work it is absolutely stunning and uh gorgeous and as is all of her work so uh make sure you find flourish and grow on the interweb, on the Instagram. And until next week, see everyone later. Bye-bye. I'll end them with this as well.
拜拜。